Our sales, for example, 30% below last year's level. You know, um, the smog, um, there, there's generally the air is clear over many cities. People are noticing buildings off in the distance that they didn't know existed before because they couldn't see them because of the smog. Um, there's also a huge effect on airline traffic, um, the aviation industry. Okay, aviation volumes in China, there has been a 50 to 90% reduction in capacity on routes departing mainland China, a 60 to 70% reduction in domestic flights within the mainland, um, and uh, these flights were responsible for about 17% of total CO2 emissions from passenger aviation. So the flight suspensions and cancellation, they've cut C global CO2 emissions from passenger flights by around 11% you know, in the past two weeks. Okay, so, so that's also happening. Okay, so basically there's huge, uh, you know, huge economic impacts to China. Newly installed wind power capacity fell 4%, solar power capacity 53% down, hydropower 53 down, nuclear 31% down. Um, Okay, um, electric vehicle sales fell 32%. Okay, so basically there's huge impacts of the virus on Chinese industry. So not surprisingly, there's huge reductions in CO2 emissions and huge reduction in aerosol emissions. And you can get a ballpark number for how much warming that's causing. Um, Chinese New Year, um, 25th of January. Um, the year of the rat. Okay, I just had to check a few things like that. This is the coronavirus epidemic. Um, just if you go into, if you Google Google Images and you type in just number of China COVID cases over time, you get all kinds of, of uh, you know, updated data. Okay, so Science Alert, I've shown you this website, lots of information on the virus, um, so it's the map um, is produced by researchers at John Hopkins University. So I talked about this and I showed you this sort of thing and you can get all kinds of real time information on various things and you can expand any of them to full screen. Um, and uh, you know you can you can zero in on on certain regions and certain you can check your country for example if I want to check in Canada here uh, we've got about 15 cases now right so then it shows you the cases and you can click on any of them and it tells you uh, well let's pick Canada Vancouver um, okay the different cases are listed here data on it Okay, so that's a very, very good um, source of information. You can just Google John Hopkins coronavirus uh, map and, uh, you know, find this, this site. Okay, um, an article saying COVID will mark the end of affluence politics. You know, it will really, sh you know, um, as it starts to spread more and more around the world, it will really be an indicator of how good health systems are in different countries. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think the U.S. is very prepared at all. I think they're very susceptible to problems because uh, the healthcare system is very expensive. Many people don't have coverage. So the people that don't have coverage that have to pay out of pocket to be tested, they'll probably just stay home, you know, and grin and bear it if you like. And those numbers won't really be counted or known in the overall uh, numbers for for the uh for the country um is is one thing i know i don't think the system is ready and is resilient at all in, in the u.s i mean hopefully i'm proven wrong so if you try to look at the effects um of you know temperature rise i mean that 0 0.06 degree globally or 0 0.25 over china you know you can look at the temperature anomaly for example in different places and there's lots of, because of the jet streams being distorted and messed up, you know, you're getting lots of these areas that are much hotter than normal, much colder than normal. I mean, this has sort of been ongoing, so it's very difficult to pick out, 
you know, this is over the region here um, where, where, where the virus is centered, Wuhan and, you know, heat here. But I mean, there's, there's blobs of heat and coldness and, you know, very, a, lot, a lot of variation over the planet. And you can't identify that, um, you know, it's specifically due to the, the virus. I mean, look, the Arctic is 1.7 degrees Celsius warmer than normal. The anomaly, the Northern Hemisphere, 1.3. The world is 0. 0. 0.7. So what I'm saying is that, you know, maybe 0. 0. 0.06 of this could be due to the uh, coronavirus. You know, and over China, 0. 0.25 would be my best sort of back of the envelope uh, number right now. You know, you can go to Earth Null School, you can click on particulates and look at PM10, and you can go over China, you know, and you can cycle through the days and see, you know, when the virus took off and try to get a signal out of that. Or you can do, you know, look at the CO2 over China, you know, look in the look at 2020, cycle through 2020, com go, go back to 20, uh, 2019 and compare. Or, you know, trying to look at, um, you know, SO2 in this case or temperature or whatever. It's very, very difficult to discern what's going on because there's a lot of variability and a lot of, a lot of noise. So it's really hard to see, you know, find that 0 0.25 degrees Celsius spike, you know, over China, for example, due to the lack of aerosols. It's very, very difficult. So if you get information on that, you know, you can search for yourself and, you know, if you have information, make sure you comment on, on the video. One thing I'd like to point out is that um, during 9-11, uh, after the terrorist attack in New York on the World Trade Center buildings, um, there was no air traffic over North America for three days. Okay, so there weren't the contrails being produced by the plane. There were fewer cirrus clouds. Now, cirrus clouds, they block some of the sunlight during the day and they trap in heat at night. So without the cirrus clouds there, more sunlight was able to hit the earth. Um, so the daily highs were actually slightly higher on those days when there was no planes flying. And the daily lows at night were actually slightly lower because more heat could escape out to space without those contrails. So thus the daily temperature range was affected okay so contrails from aircraft reduce the daily temperature range when there's no contrails if there's no planes flying then the daily temperature range increases so how much does it increase so i investigated um, some of the papers that studied this uh, u.s diurnal daily temperature range um, for the days after september 11th because of the jets commercial aircraft being grounded, and there is evidence to show the influence of these jet contrails on, on climate. So I looked like at a, a number of different papers, okay, at the data, and basically um, found this. If you compare the observations during the three-day period following the event of September, um, 11th to 13th of September in normal conditions to when, you know, in 2011, or 2001, 9-11, um, they suggested that contrails may reduce the daily temperature range over their analysis area by at least 1.1 Kelvin, so 1.1 Celsius, okay? So that's sort of the effect. So the difference between the daily high and the daily low increased by about you know 1.1 Celsius over those days when the planes weren't flying, okay? Um, so why is this important? Um, this is important because, if you, because of the um, huge reduction of air traffic, of, of airline travel over China, okay, you would expect that would, that would increase the daily temperature range. Okay, so I'm sure there'll be studies coming out looking at the daily temperature range over China as a result of the coronavirus, but I would expect that, um, you know, with less and less, with fewer and fewer planes flying, um, that there would be an increase in the daily temperature range and also that the, the daily highs would be higher by about that 0 0.25 Celsius because of the um, global dimming effect. Okay, so that's sort of the conclusion I can reach. 
And if you want to look at, if you want to get information on the global dimming, I recommend, recommend scientistswarning.org, this article, all kinds of information on global dimming. And they actually, I'm a bit biased because they actually quote me, I highlighted it. So, you know, some people have claimed that there could be a massive rise of 1.2 to 5 degrees Celsius, you know, if all industry shuttered because of global dimming. Um, basically, this is a completely absurd number, and I did a video on this and figured out that, you know, it's about 0 0.5 degrees. The range is 0.25 to 1.1 degrees Celsius. Most of the papers indicate that that number is going to be about 0 0.5 five degrees Celsius. So I went and stretched and now I'm saying, you know, if it was as high as one degree, we'd have a 0 0.06 degrees Celsius global temperature rise or 0.25 over China. If it's, ac that's assuming this number was actually one degree Celsius. So, you know, maybe it's closer to 0 0.03 globally and 0 0.125 over, over China. But anyway, have, have a look at, at this article. It's a great article all on global dimming. And it, if you just go to the scientistswarning.org website, you know, and look for this article, Debunk the Global Dimming Dilemma, it talks about all of those details. Um, also on YouTube, you can just Google um, on my YouTube channel, Global Dimming, and you find the videos that I did actually a couple years ago on the topic. And I, I, I'll probably do a video separately on, on this article and on the latest research, because it was a couple of years ago when I did that. As far as the virus goes, um, you know, um, they are working on vaccines. There's various companies. So, you know, you can, I, I mean, this is what we will need. And, you know, maybe, maybe uh, you know, science will come up with a, a vaccine fairly quickly or a way to boost the immune system to reduce the effects of this virus. In the meantime, you know, this is the Dow Jones Industrial. Um, this was the peak here on February 12th. Okay, it was 29,551, the Dow, you know, almost up to 30,000. And since then, you know, it's had multiple thousand point drop days and it's 25,400 at the close of today. So the markets are finally reacting you know, when it was just in China, they didn't care so much. You know, now it's spreading, spread to Italy, spreading other places. People are starting to worry about it more in the, the U.S. And I just want to point out um, this article from the center of, or this website, the Center for Climate and Security, exploring the security risks of climate change. You know, and I'll talk about this whole report, this new report that came out. But... Again, I want to emphasize that it's not just the coronavirus affecting the climate. The climate is affecting the risk of things like the coronavirus coming along and affecting the, the planet. And they're doing that because of there's more and more animal migration as the planet warms. More and more animals interact with each other. You know, if they're incubators for these diseases, they can become more likely to harbor them when there's a lot more interaction between species. That's one thing. Also, you know, in a warmer world, there's much more disease vectors um, available to spread diseases. I mean, think of, you know, the Lyme disease, think of Zika virus, think of malaria, things like that are all spreading more in a warmer world. You know, we can look back in history at the immune systems of Europeans being, you know, people up in, you know, living in cold latitudes, going to areas, you know, conquering areas or, or going to areas that were much, much warmer climates, like the civilizations of the Incas, Aztecs, Mayans, for example, bring, and, and basically having their diseases that they were immune to wiping out the populations of people in these regions who weren't exposed to these diseases uh, previously. So there's lots and lots of connections. Um, and uh, so, you know, please, uh, you know, make lots of comments and I'll be doing other videos and things on, on these connections as they become clearer. So again, my website, paulbeckwith.net. Please consider donating to my PayPal account. Okay, thanks for listening.